August 2, 2005. An Air France Airbus A340 departs Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris just before 2 p.m. It is on a scheduled flight to Toronto Pearson International Airport in Ontario, Canada. On board are 297 passengers and 12 crew members, including two well-seasoned pilots, Captain Alan Rosset with 15,411 hours of experience and First Officer Frederick New with 4,834 hours of experience. As part of their pre-flight preparations, the flight crew had studied the weather forecast for arrival, which included the possibility of a thunderstorm at Toronto. To avoid being caught out by the thunderstorm, the pilots decided to add three extra tons of fuel. This would allow them to hold at Toronto or divert to another airport. Seven hours into the flight and aware of the poor weather, they request forecast information for possible diversion to another airport. 30 minutes later, they perform a brief for an approach into runway 24 left at Toronto. As per procedure, they agree to make a go around in case of encountering wind shear. Thunderstorms are infamous for wind shear, which provide a grave danger to pilots due to the significant change in wind speed and direction. As flight 358 approaches the airfield, they are informed that the weather is rapidly changing, with thunderstorms and heavy rain present over the runway. At this point, the pilots agree to divert to Ottawa International Airport in case a landing is not possible. Due to increased thunderstorm activity in Toronto, the airport wind reporting system goes out of service and the pilots must rely on wind reports from other aircraft. Minutes from landing, two preceding aircraft manage to land and report poor braking action, likely to be caused by the water on the runway. As the pilots descend through 1,000 feet, only half of the runway is in sight and their navigation system displays a strong crosswind from the right of 15 to 20 knots. As the aircraft passes 323 feet, the first officer disconnects the autopilot and auto thrust. Sensing a decrease in speed and altitude, he increases the thrust, leading to a reduction in the descent rate. Simultaneously, the wind begins to shift from a crosswind to a 10 knot tailwind. The aircraft crosses the runway threshold 40 feet high and enters an area of deteriorating weather with heavy rain and almost no forward visibility. 40 feet above the runway, the first officer begins to flare. The aircraft becomes level for two and a half seconds when reaching 25 feet above the runway. 3,800 feet down the runway, the aircraft touches down left of the centerline. The flight crew react in no time and apply maximum manual brakes while trying to line up with the centerline. 16 seconds after touching down, the pilots apply maximum reverse thrust. The aircraft fails to slow down enough and leaves the runway at a speed of 80 knots which is approximately 148 km per hour, or 92 miles per hour, coming to a stop in a ravine. Fire almost immediately erupts on the left side of the aircraft and smoke begins entering the cabin. Without hesitation, the cabin crew orders the evacuation. Meanwhile, in the cockpit, the pilots find that they are without electrical power and are unable to communicate to the tower. Passengers and crew escape through the emergency exits, which are soon engulfed by fire. The last person to leave the aircraft is the first officer, who together with the captain, make a last ditch attempt to check the aircraft for any remaining passengers. All 309 passengers and crew survive, with 10 passengers and 2 crew members sustaining serious injuries. With the fire wildly developed on the left side of the aircraft, most of the passengers were forced to evacuate via the rear right slide. This was the only slide that was available for the entire duration of evacuation. After everyone was evacuated, the fire spread across the aircraft, destroying it and leaving it almost unrecognizable. With the combined experience of 20,000 hours, investigators were left wondering how the experienced crew got themselves into such a devastating situation. The Transportation Safety Board of Canada, or TSB, quickly took control of the scene and began the investigation. The primary suspect was the weather. The pilots had gathered plenty of information regarding the thunderstorm, but the intensity of the downpour still took them by surprise. They were simply not expecting the conditions to be this bad. As they crossed the threshold, they were faced with a combination of heavy rain, change in wind speed and direction, lightning strikes, and reduced visibility. The visibility had gotten so poor that the pilots were attempting to use their side windows to figure out their position relative to the runway. This combination of factors resulted in task saturation in the pilots. 
Upon perceiving a decrease in airspeed, the first officer reacted by increasing thrust, leading them to fly above the glide path. The first officer had kept the thrust on for too long, which was likely due to being distracted by the poor conditions. This was combined by an increase in tailwind, which only worsened the situation and pushed the aircraft further above the glide path. Had the autothrust been left engaged, the power would have been automatically adjusted, and the aircraft would have landed much closer to the touchdown point. It was clear that the pilots were committed to land and although faced with a number of different cues, a go-around never seemed to be an option. In reality, a go-around was always an option, regardless of how close the aircraft was to the runway. It was found that the airline only allowed captains to call for a missed approach. Had the first officer been allowed to make the call? Perhaps a decision to go around would have been more likely, ultimately allowing them to divert to their alternate airfield. Once they did touch down, they were faced with the challenges of stopping the aircraft on a severely wet runway. Rainfall data collected minutes prior to touchdown recorded an accumulation of up to 21 millimeters of water. To put that into perspective, IKO defines a runway as contaminated when more than 25% of the runway is covered by more than 3 millimeters of water. You might ask yourself why a wet runway would matter. Well, similar to when driving a car, any presence of a contaminant such as water will reduce the braking performance, due to the reduced friction between the tires and the runway surface. This could lead to the aircraft overrunning the end of the runway. This is also known as a runway excursion. Procedure calls are made upon landing, which include the call for reverse thrust. The standard call was never made, which is likely due to the pilots being overloaded. For this reason, it took the pilots 16 seconds to engage maximum reverse thrust. Had the call been made, the reverses would have been engaged earlier, which would have reduced the landing distance. To properly assess the landing distance, pilots make calculations prior to the approach. Unfortunately, Although the pilots did discuss the landing distance, they never made a calculation which considered the storm, since the company did not require it. Had they done the calculation, they would have found out that the landing distance would have been 8,780 feet, with 220 feet to spare. Unfortunately, this 220 feet was lost when the aircraft flew above the glide path, due to the increased thrust by the pilots. Once the aircraft overran the end of the runway, it was faced with rough terrain, which aggravated the situation and had a significant impact on the damage to the aircraft and injury to passengers. To minimize the consequences of a runway excursion, a runway and safety area is built in some airports. Soon after the crash, Transport Canada stated that all Canadian airports would require a runway and safety area. It was concluded that the pilot's commitment to land meant that red flags such as a wet runway, increased tailwind, flying above the glide path, and poor visibility were not given as much importance as their determination to land, making the option to go around less likely. As a result, Air France made several changes to their procedures. Firstly, their policy on go arounds was modified so that both pilots are now able to make the decision for a go around. Procedures were also put in place for the use of rain repellent, allowing for improved visibility during moderate to heavy rain. Finally, their operations manuals were updated to further emphasize the consequences of flying into areas of high thunderstorm activity. Four months after the accident, a Southwest Airlines Boeing 737 slid off the runway at Chicago, while landing in snowy conditions. At the time, landing distance assessments were not required by regulation, but were subsequently made mandatory by the FAA. It is easy to overlook warning signs when you are committed and determined to land. Accidents such as these are a reminder to all pilots that the option for a go-around should always be considered.